Hi, y'all. Let's talk a little bit about a recent poll showing that Americans, for some inexplicable reason, aren't overly confident in the honesty, integrity, competence, truthfulness, and accuracy of the media. And then the media wonders, how could this be? I mean, this is... <gasps> how shocking is it that people aren't overly confident in our truthiness? So, in my uh, former capacity as a government investigator, I would occasionally mislead people on purpose. Uh, sometimes you do that by telling an overt lie. You overtly misrepresent uh, facts. You, you say things that you know to be false. Uh, that sometimes is useful. And other times, you simply say things that are true but incomplete and allow someone else to fill in the details for you and then to respond to what they imagine that you've said rather than what it is that you have actually said. Uh, one of the reasons you see people being so careful in their language, well, political officials, uh, when they testify before Congress or whatever, is partly because of that. Uh, because if you're not uh, if if you're not very careful about what it is that you say, people will draw inferences uh, from what you've said that aren't necessarily what you've implied, and someone can run away with it. This is one of the reasons that the Congress creatures uh, like to interrupt interrupt witnesses. Um, and then interject before the person gets to finish the second half of the sentence, which would be required in order for whatever the proposition is to be complete and accurate. It's not, it's advent, it, it is advantageous to the Congress creature to stop you before you finish that other part of the sentence so they can then later accuse you of trying to mislead them when in fact the witness uh, would have actually been trying to... Um, fully answer their question. Now sometimes the witnesses uh, will you, will exploit this too and uh, they will pretend that they have been foreclosed from saying something when they've actually been given the opportunity to say it and they just decline to say it. So you can always get some some gamesmanship going on there. Now I want to talk about the way some of the ways that the media goes about misrepresenting things. Sometimes they just lie and other times they say things that are true but they fail to say the next thing that would also be required, that's also true, to be said in order to make the, the claim that has been proposed, the, pro uh, the proposition that's, that's been proposed, not only true, but uh, sufficiently complete that the person who's reading it will draw the correct inference. Uh, I'm not going to actually talk about any current controversies because the heat of the day will, will distract from the central point, so I'm going to go back about a decade or so and talk about some, some stuff from, well, a decade or so ago. Uh, now, before someone says, oh, well, if he lied in his official capacity, then surely he lies here. Um, no, when I was doing it, I was, it's not my personal capacity uh, that I was doing this. It was an investigative tool during interrogations or interviews in trying to solve crimes. And sometimes when dealing with a criminal element, uh, you can't send in angels who are naive. You need people who know how to play the game and, uh, and can actually talk to these people and push them around a little bit, see how they're going to react, find out where their weaknesses are, exploit that, and then get the person to uh, finally give you the true version of events um, so you can wrap up a case. Uh, this will be aired completely fully in court. Uh, this will be disclosed to that person's uh, attorney when they're, when they're stupid enough to talk to the police. <laughs> Everyone has the constitutional right not to speak. They have the right to remain silent, but most people don't have the ability. In my private life, I, I spend a great deal of effort trying to make sure that I say things that are true but also sufficiently complete that the person, uh, a reasonable person, will not be confused by what it is that I'm saying. They will draw an inference that's in the ballpark of what it is I'm trying to say. One of the reasons my videos tend to be long is, one, I don't script them, so I, I don't put in the time to make them shorter. Uh, for those of you who write a lot, you'll know that it can take a lot of effort to, to distill down um, really complicated stuff into, short, um, into a short bit of text that's just as complete and de uh, just as complete um, as a longer version in an extemporaneous style that I choose to use here. But I want this to be more conversational. This is how I'd actually be in a conversation with people, uh, except that sometimes when I'm talking to people in real life, they, like, open their mouths and talk back, <laughs> unlike here. When that is massively inconvenient. I should invent a device where you can muzzle people, like a remote. Anyway, uh, one of, and that's one of the reasons my videos tend to be long, is in addition to making my point, I also go through the pains of explaining what it is that I'm saying. So anyway, um, one way that you can mislead people is simply by recharacterizing an argument and looking at the things that are logically compatible with it and indeed implied by what has been said and then pretending as though this more restricted claim is what was actually proposed without pointing out that uh, there was actually an additional part of that 
uh, that would change the flavor of the conversation. So I'll pick a, a rather fanciful example about whether or not men and women can jump to the moon. Everyone's going to agree with me, I hope. I get some crazies around here from time to time, and that uh, we are not able to jump to the moon. Now, out of that proposition, you can recharacterize what I've been said in such a way as to manufacture uh, misogyny. It's actually not that hard to do. All you have to do is realize that women are a subset of everyone, of the human species, and that um, you can discuss the confidence in an ability in a positive way or a negative way. So you could say that uh, Justy has, has argued that he does not trust women to be able to do a thing. In this case, I've chosen something fanciful, uh, but you can make it something more realistic and you can see how this will work. Which is true. I've argued that. I don't trust that women can jump to the moon. Of course, I argued far more than that. I positively know, and since I know it, I therefore believe it, and since I believe it, I therefore trust it, uh, that women cannot do it because it is beyond the ability of any woman and indeed of any man, and because it's beyond the capability of any human, a fortiori it's beyond the ability of a woman, and because that I believe that it is impossible, because it is in fact impossible, then a fortiori I do not trust them. And if you define misogyny to be hatred of or lack of trust in women, uh, QED. You can, you can play that game, and feminists do play that game, granted not on fanciful examples like what I've chosen, uh, but in, in real world things, they will characterize arguments in such a way. Now, it's dishonest to do that, but you don't actually have to tell any lies. So when someone responds to it, they can't actually truthfully say, they can't accurately say, accurately say, that's not true, because it is, in fact, true that I do not trust that women can jump to the moon, because they actually cannot, and I'm confident that they, they lack that ability. So you can, you can um, spin confidence as, uh, I'm confident that they cannot do X, or I am not confident that they can do X, uh, and uh, the, the, those have different kinds of connotations. That's not always sufficient to get your result, and when, you, when mere word games won't do it, you just have to make shit up, you just have to lie, and uh, this is not something that's unknown to the news media, but the way they generally do it is they'll have an expert come in and talk, um, uh, and, and talk about a various subject, and then that person will state some completely made up of a quote-unquote opinion, which the paper then chooses to elect to select out of all the proper opinions that they could select, but they choose the one that's favorable to their position and say, well, according to this person, this is so. And then they're covered. They've not lied. They have accurately quoted what, a lie that someone else has told. Uh, so, going back, I did, this, I did an unbiased search on, uh, any, many, many of you might remember the so-called Guantanamo Bay cases, uh, like Hamdi against Rumsfeld is what I'm going to talk about. I did, an, I did an unbiased search on CNN, MSNBC, various news organizations about Justice Scalia, because this is one of the subjects, uh, he was a subject about which the media loves to tell lies. And so they found some, uh, some lawyer named Marcy A. Hamilton who was prepared to uh, uh, just outright lie about what Justice Scalia said in the Hamdi case. So I will read an excerpt from this article from... Uh, 2004, written by Marcy A. Hamilton, Esquire. Indefinite detention without judicial review is the section of the article uh, from which I quote. One of those principles holds that a person cannot be in held indefinitely at the whim of the executive without recourse to some means of review of the facts on which his detention is based. The Kafkaesque uh, nightmare of indefinite detention without review has been the hallmark of fascist systems, not of the United States. I do seem to recall we rounded up quite a lot of people during World War II, but putting that off to the side. Uh, in light of this reality, the Bush administration blundered when it decided to submit briefs defending indefinite detention without review. Indefinite detention without a trial on the merits is constitutionally suspect enough by itself. Keeping detainees in what amounts to a black box with no judicial oversight is beyond the pale, at least where there is no imminent threat of extreme danger. Justice O'Connor's opinion for the four justice plurality in Hamdi captured this crucial principle. As O'Connor wrote, striking the proper constitutional balance here is of great importance to the nation during this period of ongoing combat. But it is equally vital that our calculus not give short shrift to the values that this country holds dear or to the privilege that is American citizenship. In contrast, 
Justice Scalia believes that it is nonsensical to talk about balancing constitutional rights against necessity or to be willing to abandon some liberties for life. But his view, I believe, is a fundamental misunderstanding of the spirit of the Constitution. This belief of his that she has made up entirely out of whole cloth and CNN is parading this as truth but with the, uh, the wink and the nod that this is an opinion piece. It's important to remember that the protection of the life actually precedes that of liberty in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. One can hardly argue that the government is required to put citizens at risk of terrorist attack in order to serve liberty. <laughs> I don't recall anyone making that argument, but whatever. Um, uh, not just a glee, anyway. After all, when life is dramatically at risk, liberty is inherently diminished. Thus, context and balancing are inevitable features of the constitutional order. So uh, let, let's review the important part, her uh, rendition, <laughs> her extraordinary rendition. <laughs> Some people will get that. That joke's a bit on the inside. Uh, of Justice Scalia is, uh, quote, in contrast, Justice Scalia believes that it is nonsensical to talk about balancing constitutional rights against necessity or to be willing to abandon some liberties for life. But his view, I believe, is a fundamental misunderstanding of the spirit of the Constitution. Curiously enough, Justice Scalia is not in this, the, the habit of talking about the spirit of the Constitution. <laughs> he does this really strange thing as a lawyer. He talks about the text of the Constitution and the history that, that informs it. So this is what Justice Scalia actually said uh, from the bench and wrote in his, uh, his dissent from the Hamby case. When I, said, when I saw that Scalia had dissented and then I read this in 2004, I thought, holy shit, I guess he's gone off the reservation. Imagine my surprise when I went to actually listen to what he had to say and read what he actually wrote, that it bore no relationship whatever to what she says. So here's what he, what, in, in part, what he has to say. This is an excerpt, rather lengthy. Uh, it starts off by noting that um, the acts that are at issue here, a an American citizen taking up arms against the United States, actually something mentioned in the Constitution. It's a little something called treason. Anyway. <clears throat> Citizens aiding the enemy have been treated as traitors subject to the criminal process. In England, as early as 1350, the statute of treasons made it a crime to levy war against the king. Subjects accused of doing so were routinely prosecuted for treason. The founders inherited that tradition, which is why our Constitution contains a treason clause. This defines treason as, among other things, levying war against the United States. And it provides that no person shall be convicted of that crime unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. Quite clearly, a citizen's levying war against the United States was to be punished criminally. There are undoubtedly times when military exigency requires detention of a citizen without criminal charge. In England, before the founding, Parliament on numerous occasions passed temporary suspensions of the writ of habeas corpus in times of threatened invasion or rebellion, including during the American Revolution. Our federal constitution's guarantee of habeas corpus contains a provision explicitly permitting suspension, but limiting the situations in which it may be invoked. It reads, quote, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. This suspension clause was used for the first time during the Civil War when Congress passed a law authorizing executive suspension of the writ, and it has been used on several occasions since. And that is, in a nutshell, what this case is about. Whether in the current wartime circumstances, the constitutionally prescribed emergency means of enabling detention of citizens without criminal charge shall be adhered to, or whether the executive alone or the executive with the approval of this court can devise some other means of meeting the emergency. The government justifies Hamidi, uh, uh, the, the detention of, of Hamidi, on principles of the law of war. It made the same claim that it could ignore the common law requirement of criminal trial with respect to an alleged traitor captured during the Civil War. This court's reply in a famous case called Ex parte Milligan was as follows. 
If it was dangerous in the distracted condition of affairs to leave Milligan unrestrained of his liberty because he conspired against the government, afforded aid and comfort to rebels, and incited the people to insurrection, the law said to arrest him, confine him closely, render him powerless to do further mischief, and then present his case to the grand jury of the district with proofs of his guilt, and if indicted, try him according to the course of the common law. I frankly do not know whether, in the current emergency, criminal prosecution is sufficient to meet the government's security needs, including the need to obtain intelligence through interrogation. It is far beyond my competence or the Court's competence to determine that. But it is not beyond Congress's. If the situation demands it, the Executive can ask Congress to authorize suspension of the writ, which can be made subject to whatever conditions Congress deems appropriate, including even the procedural novelties invented by the plurality today. To be sure, suspension is limited by the Constitution to cases of rebellion or invasion. But whether the attacks of September 11, 2001 constitute an invasion and whether those attacks still justify suspension several years later are questions for Congress rather than this Court. If civil rights are to be curtailed during wartime, it must be done openly and democratically as the Constitution requires, rather than by silent erosion through an opinion of this Court. I will conclude with an opinion from the famous commentaries on the laws of England, written by Blackstone about 11 years before the American Revolution. He said, to bereave a man of life or by violence to confiscate his estate without accusation or trial would be so gross and notorious an act of despotism as must at once convey the alarm of tyranny throughout the kingdom. But confinement of the person by secretly hurrying him off to jail where his sufferings are unknown or forgotten, is a less public, a less striking, and therefore a more dangerous engine of arbitrary government. To make imprisonment lawful, it must either be by process from the courts of judicature or by warrant from some legal officer having authority to commit to prison, which warrant must express the causes of the commitment in order to be examined into, if necessary, upon a habeas corpus. If there be no cause expressed, the jailer is not bound to detain the prisoner. For the law judges in this respect that it is unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to signify with all the crimes alleged against him. This passage was well known to the framers. It it was quoted by Hamilton in Federalist Number 84. Uh... The, the Marcy A. Hamilton, Esquire, says that Scalia believes it's nonsensical to talk about balancing constitutional rights against necessity or being or to be willing to abandon some liberties for life. And his actual position is if civil rights of liberties are to be curtailed during wartime, it must be done openly and democratically as the Constitution requires rather than by silent erosion through an opinion of this court. Scalia is not saying what this, uh, the good Esquire uh, says that he says. He's saying if this is to be done, it can be done, and indeed the Constitution allows for it to be done, and here's how you go do it. So if that's what, you, if that's what really needs to happen, then it should happen, and it should happen properly. It should not happen uh, by, by route of justice in the night. The silent curtailing of privileges, written in a footnote in a court opinion, when the court was never given any power uh, to curtail this, this, uh, this liberty, to do what it was doing in the Hamby case. Congress, however, was, and it may do so uh, whenever the public safety shall require it during an, an actual invasion or rebellion. Um, so she just lied. Characterizing it one way wouldn't do it. You know, it's not a matter of coloring, you know, like the confidence thing I spoke about earlier. It's not a matter of saying something that's true and failing to say the next part that's also true that you should say if you want to be honest in, in order uh, to make sure that the person will draw the wrong conclusion. She just outright makes shit up. 
Now, I have in the past talked about what I use the news for. And by the way, there's a good video from Vernaculus, I should have mentioned this at the outset, on this, uh, this recent issue. I'll put a link to it below under my PayPal and Patreon information. Thank you for, uh, for signing up for all that. I, I know all of you will. Anyway, it's a, it's a really good video that he did despite the background music, Pony Slay Station. I agree with you that I would say something about that. Anyway, uh, so link below. But I've talked about what I use the media for. Uh, it's, it's really like um, finding someone's diary or, or Wikipedia or reading a gossip rag. There might be something there to look into. If it's interesting, then I go do research. If it isn't, I remember that I read it, but I don't credit it. So it's, it's a jumping off part. It's not something I go to as a source of actual information about what's happening, uh, a true account of what's happening in the world. When I, want, uh, true, when I want to do that, the best place to go, for, uh, as I've mentioned in other videos, is to listen to, to oral arguments in, in courts, appellate courts in particular. Because our, our uh, judicial system doesn't deal with abstract cases that, that might come up. You have to have a live case or a live controversy. So these cases that arise and go up to the court are because of things that have actually happened. And the lawyers there... Uh, can be generally trusted within certain constraints, to be honest. And the reason for it is that they're required to be. They can't just say true things. They have a positive, affirmative obligation to avoid knowingly misleading the court. They cannot knowingly mislead another party. And if they recognize that either a, another party or the court is laboring under a misunderstanding of what the person has said, they are obligated to correct it. The media has no such obligation. And lawyers outside of court, outside of litigation, where they're representing a client, have no such obligation, which is why Marcy ha Marcy A. Hamilton, Esquire, can lie in, in, a, in this opinion piece that she wrote when she could not get away with doing that in court. And if you listen to the Supreme Court arguments in particular, all the justices uh, re react very negatively when a person, even inadvertently, misstates another person's position or a fact in the case, and they will stop the argument, they will stop the hearing, and uh, correct you. And uh, one of the things about the Supreme Court justices is that they are all remarkably well prepared. They know your case. They know the record. And if you misstate something, uh, they will tell you. If you look at, you know, if you go to the blue brief and look at this page, this, uh, or you know, that appendix to this or whatever, or this footnote or there, uh, you are not stating this, this correctly. And the Chief Justice, uh, Rehnquist used to do this uh, with some frequency, he would stop, you, know, you need to be more careful about what you're saying in this court. Uh, lawyers who fail to take that advice can be uh, sanctioned, they can have their law license suspended, they can be disbarred. And the United States Supreme Court, uh, every week, has a, it publishes miscellaneous orders, a common feature of which is attorney discipline, where they're disbarring attorneys. They really, this, the United States Supreme Court really does take... Um, attorney conduct quite seriously, and they don't brook people who come in there and try to shine them on. Um, and another, another thing that, um, uh, that lawyers have to do in court, that they don't have to do on the talk shows, and that no one has to do on the talk shows, is they actually have to a answer the question they're asked. And if you try to get around it, you're going to be eating into your time where you could be winning your case, but instead uh, you're having, you, you have now decided to butt heads with a justice who wants a substantive answer to the question that you are trying to evade, and they are going to eat up your time. If it takes the rest of your case before you finally answer their question, you will not make any progress on your case. And if that makes, and if, and if because of that you lose your case, you are a very bad advocate. A, a great example of this is uh, Tenet against Doe, where Justice Souter, who's normally pretty, pretty sedate and reserved, they're all pretty sedate and reserved, you know, they're very, like, Church of England, hello. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stealing from Eddie Ezra there. Anyway, I'll put a, a, an excerpt of it here, where the lawyer's trying to get around answering the question that Justice Souter is putting to him. And finally, Justice Souter gets quite annoyed. And it, Anyway, it's hysterical. We claim privilege, and on the basis of that privilege, we, we claim dismissal. What is your response to that? If that were an essential element of our claim, which we believe it is not. Well, they're not saying it's an essential element in the sense that only a spy can make a 110 claim. 
They're saying that the only basis upon which you can make a 110 claim is the spy relationship. You have no other. How do you respond to that? Hence the reason we brought the case as does, a procedure that was not known for that purpose at the time of Totten, that their own information officer and their brief and their position in Webster admits pre- uh, preserves the identity, preserves the secret. They look, look, you're talking about procedural means. I want to know what your immediate response to their claim of privilege is. Are you going to say we weren't spies? The advantage of the Reynolds procedure is if they had made the claim of privilege, we would know what they were claiming was privilege. They are making the claim of privilege on the ground that the only basis for your 110 claim is or can be on facts known to them that your clients were spies. Do you respond by saying, yes, we were spies, or do you respond by saying we weren't spies? We respond by saying we have an entitlement to a fair process within the agency. Let's assume that you have a really obnoxious court that wants a substantive response. (laughs) Do you respond by saying they're right, we're spies, or they're wrong, we weren't spies? If their position is that they can't confirm or deny to the district court whether we were spies. They are claiming a privilege on the grounds that the only basis for your claim can possibly be the spy relationship based on facts known to them. In order to defeat that privilege, you've got at least to start by saying, no, we weren't spies and we don't claim to be. Are you going to say that or aren't you? We are not going to say we were not spies. We are. Then I don't know why you're not out of court on Totten. Now, I mentioned that within constraints, you can trust these attorneys. One of the people are always going to try to game the system, and attorneys are no different. Uh, one of the uh, <laughs> one of the ways that that the system can be gamed is that if you if uh, you are going to be a party to it, and you don't inform an attorney of something, then they don't have actual knowledge of that fact. And they can, therefore, because of their ignorance, make certain representations they wouldn't otherwise be able to make if they were aware of that fact. So if, uh, if they're not very industrious and studious about getting all the, the facts, then they can say certain things they wouldn't otherwise be able to say. And an example of this is Nicole Saharsky, who's a great attorney, uh, assistant to the Solicitor General. And she's argued a couple of cases on, well, various issues, but in particular, uh, one of them is called it was the McNeely case, and it was about blood draws uh, for DUIs, um, whether or not you need to get a warrant to order a blood draw. And she's trying to say that it is, uh, that it, the timing matters because it's not just DUI, but it's aggravated DUI, and every second after, the, every second the person breathes, they are destroying evidence. And that creates an exigent circumstance. This is just not true. Now, I don't think that she knows it. In fact, I'm, I'm quite certain she doesn't know that this is true, uh, because I would not impute to her uh, dishonesty and misleading the court at all. She, she is a very good attorney. She just doesn't know how alcohol exits the, 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 um, the blood. It is simply, uh, well, it's not necessarily true. It's sometimes true and sometimes false, that every breath you take is eliminating evidence because of the way alcohol is absorbed. Um, some of you may have imbibed some libations in your time, and you may have had food while imbibing those evil libations. And you might have noticed that sometimes you get drunker at, uh, you, you, at, a, at a quicker rate than at other times, and sometimes you don't feel like you're getting drunk, you don't feel like you're really getting a good buzz going on, and then suddenly you realize, holy shit, I'm drunk, what happened? What happened is the way your digestive system works. It's not a chemical process, it's a physical process. Uh, alcohol is not well absorbed through the stomach, Uh, So most alcohol absorption takes place in the intestine. Well, when you eat, what happens? It closes the pyloric sphincter and keeps all all that bolus, that content, in your stomach. So you're adding alcohol and adding alcohol and adding alcohol, not a lot of which is being absorbed through the stomach. And then after after the little digestion churning happens, the pyloric sphincter opens, goes into the intestine, and suddenly starts getting absorbed very quickly. So um, there's no reason that Saharsky should know this because there's no obligation for lawyers of the government to learn about police work or, or these, these various types of things. And because of her ignorance, she's able to honestly, though incorrectly, make that representation to the court. She just doesn't know what she's talking about, which works to her advantage. Law enforcement officers know that this works to the, 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 the government's advantage, and so sometimes they won't inform attorneys of these pesky little details. And after all, <laughs> there's a ready-made excuse. Well, they didn't ask. <laughs> so... 
How am I supposed to know that they don't know what they're doing? It's not my job to make sure that the attorneys uh, do background research to be sufficiently competent to ask only the intelligent question. I, <laughs> and it's certainly not my obligation as a law enforcement official, because I don't, <laughs> to, to go into court and to interrupt when the attorney's talking and say, objection, your honor. You know, that's, that's what the other person's counsel's for. It's not my fault that the other person has an incompetent counsel. So you have, you have ways that the system can be gamed, and indeed that it is gamed. It, it happens, um, I'm sorry to say. Welcome to American justice. But this is going to happen in any system. Um, it, look at video games. Uh, lots and lots of coders spend lots and lots of time uh, putting parameters into the game. And one of the first things, uh, there's always a, a large subset of players that want to they want to find out where all the hacks are, where are all the, the glitches that I can exploit. They're looking for that shit. So too are attorneys. They're looking for every advantage they can find uh, to win their cases. And when they're, uh, <laughs> when they're representing someone, as they do, that person's also interested, uh, in many cases, in the outcome of that case. And so they're going to help that along by not being particularly helpful um, in, in, in informing the attorney. And if, indeed, a good example of this was Bill Clinton's uh, deposition to the grand jury, where one of the attorneys uh, for, for the special prosecutor, special counsel, was uh, asking him some questions. And Bill Clinton, uh, very appropriately in this case, said, it sounds to me, counsel, as though you're complaining that, <laughs> that I'm not doing your job for you. Essentially, you, you seem to be whining that my attorney's doing a better job for me <laughs> than you're doing for your client. He says, I wanted to give you true answers that weren't particularly helpful, which is perfectly legal to do. Uh, <clears throat> as an attorney, he can't do that. He has an obligation to go further. But as a person who's being asked questions, he doesn't have that obligation. You have to give the truth and the whole truth. But one of the parts of the adversarial process is that it's up to the opposing counsel to ask the right questions. You don't have to volunteer information. And this attorney was clearly deficient in asking questions that he should have asked and failed to ask and therefore was ignorant of certain things. And Bill Clinton had a heyday with that in front of the grand jury. I thought it was hysterical. Uh, anyway, this, this game can always be played. Um, so, so long as you understand the strengths and weaknesses of the adversarial system, the obligations of attorneys, like judges often do, um, you can trust attorneys within certain constraints, one of which is they have to actually be in court and they actually have to be representing someone else. It can't be just one of these opinion pieces like uh, this Marcy A. Hamilton Esquire has pulled out of her ass and just completely made up because they're free to lie just the same as anybody else is free to lie. Uh, or, I'm sorry, free to have an opinion that is just completely based on nothing, <laughs> as the next person, which they can't get away with in court. And the news media knows that the obligation of a lawyer in court is different than the, the obligation of a lawyer not representing a client outside of court. And that's precisely why uh, they, want to, they want to talk about what happens on the talk shows or, or the various programs where it's not really news, it's, it's infotainment, rather than paying attention to what is said in court. And as I've said this in other contexts, but I'll say it again here. Don't pay attention so much to what, a, what politicians and their surrogates say in public um, when there is a case that touches on that matter. Pay attention to what their lawyers say in court, because that is the actual position of the government, unlike what the politician has said. For example, this notion that I have an obligation to protect the community, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, you might, you might feel some, some obligation to do that. But the other part of the sentence that should be said that never is said by politicians uh, is that it's not a binding obligation. It's not one that anyone can expect. And indeed, you have no expectation that I'm actually going to do anything to help you. It's a general obligation that no one can lay claim to. And you better believe that it, the distinction matters because when a, a citizen tries to lay claim to this promise of a politician that the government would do this, the government would do that, and the government has this obligation, they will run into court with very well-paid lawyers who are excellent at what they do to explain to the court exactly why it is no such obligation actually exists. And indeed, in all such cases, the Supreme Court of the United States has agreed with the government. No such obligation exists. It is uh, a complete talking point based on nothing when you hear a politician say it. Anyway, I think I'll just leave this here. Uh, have a great day.